peace to you all from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, about a mile off the southeastern coast of France, there sits a tiny island. The island is composed of a single fortress. It's heavily fortified with high towers and steep walls. And they overlook the cliffs going right down into the ocean. At one time, it served as a military station, but it's most famous for being a prison. It is an isolated and dangerous offshore currents around this prison, and it makes it ideal for preventing the prisoners to escape. In the 19th century, the Chateau d'If, that's what this prison is called, was used to detain political and religious prisoners. In the accommodations, they were dismal, they were crude. Life in that prison was a pretty grim affair. And it made it one of the most notorious jails in the 19th century. The lower dungeons, they were dug deep down into the foundation of this fortress. And there was no chance of contact with anybody in there from the outside world. And now this prison became famous early in the 19th century when a Frenchman, Alexandre Dumas, used it for a setting for his novel, The Count of Monte Cristo. And if you've read the book or seen the movie, you know that the main character in Dumas' classic, in fact, escapes from this prison. But that just proves it's a work of fiction, because as long as this was a prison, no one had ever escaped from there. Its captives had no chance, no way out, and no hope. They were just there. You know, captivity was not uncommon in the scriptures, easy. Multiple times the people of God experienced what it meant to be held captive, Way back when there was slavery in Egypt and the days of Moses and the people there, they labored under the unsympathetic hand of the Pharaoh. And they suffered greatly at the hand of all these brutal taskmasters that he put in charge of them. And they cried out to God for deliverance. Then there was the captivity in Babylon after the king of Nebuchadnezzar, after he sacked Jerusalem and he carted off all the people back to Babylon and he forced them into exile and they were taken from their homeland and they had to live under new laws in Babylon in a foreign land. In the days of Jesus they lived under the thumb of the Roman Empire and its succession of governors and rulers. The people of God they knew captivity. So did the individuals in the Old Testament. And if you read it carefully, we read about Joseph and Jeremiah and Daniel. All three of those, they spent time in prison. In the New Testament, it was John the Baptist. It was also Peter and Paul. None of these residents and none of these people were from the Chateau d'If but they still knew what it meant to be held captive. They knew what it meant to long for freedom. They understood the helplessness that they experienced, and they had little or no hope of escape. Unlike them, you and I, we live in the land of the free, don't we? We're not captive, thank the Lord, and you and I don't serve any foreign masters. We enjoy the freedom of a country where we live, we can do whatever we want. We live under our own sovereign rights, autonomous and entirely independent, right? Maybe not quite, but we do live in a system of relative self-governance. But this doesn't mean that you and I are free from captivity. Indeed, tonight I'd like to help you consider the fact that we do know what it means to be captive 
and what it means to be in prison. To live under a foreign master. But I have a different kind of captivity in mind. We may live here in the land of the free, which I just described to you, but we are imprisoned by more insidious masters. Greed, lust, desire for more. We suffer from an insatiable desire and longing for more stuff in this world, more pleasure, more recognition. It's the father who can't stand stop to stop working. He takes on more work, either because he needs more money to keep his family with that style of living, or because his job is never secure enough to let him relax. It's a woman who can't stop filling her closet or who can't stop working out because she's captive to an image of herself some 10 or 15 years ago. It's the teenage girl who can't stop looking at that Instagram because she needs more likes. Or maybe the teenage boy who's imprisoned by the phone and the images that it so easily delivers. These people are captives just as surely as these people that were in the prison. They're not in that stone prison or a foreign land, but they're stuck. They're just as confined. They're just as helpless as those prisoners were. There are other prisons too. The unhealthy relationship that you can't get out of. The addictive behavior that overpowers any force of your own will. The dead-end job that you can't live with, and frankly, you can't live without it. And I'm afraid that you and I know captivity all too well. This Lent, we're trying to confess the gospel in a short and concise summaries. We're trying to find the right words with which we might proclaim what God has done for you and me in our Lord Jesus Christ. There are actually many ways that you and I might do this. As we read the scriptures, we can find many images and metaphors and descriptions of God and his work for our salvation. We read about the good shepherd rescuing his sheep. We read about the suffering servant taking on our punishment. We read about God speaking through a prophet to breathe breath and life into dry bones. We read about the Lamb of God who reigns on his throne. Any one of these could help us summarize the gospel. But tonight I'd like to do an exercise with our various prisons in mind. And as we do, so we'll do this from our reading from Luke. And it provides some, us some direction tonight. In Luke, we reread about one of the first recorded sermons of Jesus. And here's how Luke puts it. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, just like you're in church here tonight. And he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up that scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. In the eyes of everybody in that synagogue, they were fixed on him. And he said to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And when Jesus said that, the people marveled. They were amazed at which authority and how he spoke. And I have to believe one of the reasons for their marveling, it was the imagery that Jesus picked up from what, the, what Isaiah said that was so poignant. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. This describes the good news of Jesus Christ. 
Then he frees his people. He frees you and he frees me from captivity. Earlier I mentioned a number of prisons that you and I live in on a daily basis. Greed, popularity, addiction. Behind all of them is the sin that St. Paul talks about in Romans 7, one of the greatest chapters in the entire Bible. He describes his experience as a Christian. He describes, like all of us, who, how badly he wants to remain faithful to Jesus and his word, but how sin in his heart, it compels him to follow his own desires. And in the end, he recognizes that he's just helpless and how helpless he truly is, that he can't do this by himself. And he laments. He said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who can secure his release? He says, who can deliver him from guilt and shame? Who can rescue him from a life of service to sin? Who can set him free? St. Paul knows there's only one who can do that, and that's our Savior, Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God who freed Paul and who frees each of us from all that imprisons us. Sin, death, despair, selfishness. He has freed us through his life and death and resurrection. And he continues to free us from every single prison, every single master, every single captive that takes us prisoner. And how might you and I confess the gospel this evening? Well, let's say Jesus frees us from all our prisons. In Psalm 34, David wrote, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near. He's near to you and he's near to the brokenhearted. And he saves those of us who are crushed in spirit. And many are our afflictions, because many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord, he delivers them, and he delivers us out of them all. My dear brothers and sisters, the good news this evening is that Jesus, and only Jesus, frees us from sin and from all that holds you and I captive. Through the might of his word, and for his glory and for our good. Jesus frees us from sin and death and the devil, that you and I might live in freedom and love, so that we might share this freedom. We don't keep it in ourselves, so we might share this freedom with those of our friends, our loved ones, those we meet that are suffering in captivity. And yes, Jesus frees us from all our prisons in life and he frees others too. And as we proclaim this good news to them, this is one more way that you and I can confess the gospel in the world. But don't let this stop you from thinking about other ways to bring people to Christ. Keep working on your own confessions and keep reflecting on God's love in Christ. And keep sharing. Keep sharing that hope that you have in you, in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all our understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.